Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. We're glad you're here today. The 76th episode airs the agenda for today on Friday, September 24th of 2021. As usual, we're going to bring you a little bit of the Michigan COVID news. Uh, after that, pitch party round for judging. Very excited to have the judging today. The companies that pitched this quarter, Wearology, Maverick Biomedical, and HDO Health. So we'll be hearing from our judges today. After that, time for Q&A and community announcements. But first off, I want to take you to some of the COVID metrics and vaccine distribution information. We're going to do that uh, through some of the raw documents today. Often we will cut these out and stick them into a PowerPoint for flow, but we're going to go to some raw documents today. Um, and first, this uh, from CNN, CDC is actually going a little bit off uh, script from its advisors. Um, you recall that last week, actually basically while we were in the show, FDA was uh, debating uh, and discussing whether to approve Pfizer for boosters. CDC is largely following that advice, but has deviated a little bit. Uh, they've added those who are ages 18 to 64, but at increased risk to COVID to the list of people who can receive a booster. So uh, interesting there, uh, but that is, a, that is a change from what we would have heard last week um, and coming out of the meeting last week. Also this, uh, what we usually pull from is this document from the CDC. This document being the Michigan State Synopsis uh, from which we select. Today I'm actually going to scroll through the document uh, in its raw form so you can see how this is laid out, which I don't know if we've done before. They do have a little dashboard up here at the top. Obviously cases continuing to climb in the state of Michigan. A little bit of good news that uh, at least on a weekly basis the rate of new COVID-19 deaths down 26% from a prior week and some statistics there with regards to vaccination for the state. This graphic continues to just get darker and darker and darker. This is the cases per 100,000 in the last seven days uh, with respect to vaccination status. Um, the darkest categories represent high vaccination levels and high transmission rates and uh, the map continues to darken. Uh, we'll go past this, a lot of numbers there that we won't process together, but in terms of new cases, new caseload does continue to climb. We had wondered if it might be plateauing last week, but it does appear to continue to climb. But the positivity rate does seem to be plateauing. That holds as a trend in the state of Michigan. Deaths, as we said just a minute ago, wow, they seem to be uh, dropping or, or plateauing. Uh, great news there. Lots of information about vaccination by category. Now I need to note that last week, uh, one of the questions that we received, which we still don't have a good answer for, was how things like hospitalizations relate to uh, vaccination status, relate to prior infection. It was something we discussed internally. And while there are many uh, countries in the world that seem to be doing a good job of tracking things like breakthrough cases and everything else, we remind you that the CDC actually declined to track that information a while ago. And this seems to be the theme that uh, data collection has not been a priority all the way through this. Um, it's better than it was in a lot of ways, but some of the most interesting questions that we can ask the data doesn't seem to be there to answer them. So that's a disappointing um, thing to report here. If we were in the UK or Israel, that might be different. The hospitalizations uh, do continue to stay low. Of course, that's offset by the worker shortages uh, that happen. So you will hear about a lot of hospitals that are uh, having a hard time staying staffed, even with the lower hospitalization rates from COVID. And community transmission in the state of Michigan, still pretty much in the red. So uh, we've seen it hit the trough here. We'll see how long that trough lasts. The two prior troughs, uh, you can get a gauge on the width of those. 
This in terms of hospitalizations, we've given you the, the basic information there, we won't belabor that. But nationwide, we're going to get into some of the nationwide data here uh, in terms of vaccinations here. This is the graph that we always show. Vaccinations continuing to drop after a little uptick at the end of August, uh, but the vaccinations do continue to drop nationwide. And uh, a lot of data here, we won't belabor it, but if you were interested, you could find vaccination information by race and ethnicity, one dose, multiple doses, by age group, et cetera. Of course, here you have the highest age group uh, being the one with the highest vaccination rate, which makes uh, a good deal of sense as well. And in terms of cases, the country continues to be red, uh, with the darkest red representing 750 or more cases per 100,000 people. So we certainly uh, see that in the, uh, in the south, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hotbeds there. And that's compared to three months before. Three months before, you basically couldn't find cases in the U.S. Uh, if we look at the uh, data there on the bottom right, uh, so obviously this changed significantly uh, in the last three months. Positivity, nucleic acid po um, positivity rates, and hospital admissions nationwide. I will say that this is starting to look better from what it looked like a few weeks ago. Uh, the country was pretty well awash in red, uh, so hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we're starting to see some improvement there. But again, compared to three months before, uh, when things were much, much better, you can see a dramatic change there. Deaths. Uh, seem to be uh, highest in the south and also interestingly in Idaho and Montana, a uh, little outlier there, again compared to three months before. And in terms of community transmission, while it's starting to give way a little tiny bit, mostly a sea of red across the country with transmission rates being in the high category on a county by county basis. So that is the raw format of the CDC's uh, graphics that we bring to you every week. I thought we'd just show it to you in its PDF form here, which you can get from cdc.gov if you're interested. Uh, some good information in there, but like we said, there's information we'd sure love to have that we have not been able to find from credible reporting sources. And, uh, and that's, still a, that's still a crying shame. So I uh, want to bring you that news as well. With that, I'm going to go back to our uh, PowerPoint here because it is time for the thing that you are all here for, and that is the $2,500 quarterly MedTech Crossroads pitch party competition, or rather, uh, as we say, it's just a party. Uh, hold on, we just lost our uh, share there. We're going to resume the share on that. There we go. And we call it a party because you really can't judge winners and losers when you're dealing in different verticals, different sorts of companies. So here's the plan as we've done it now in our fourth installment. The pitch party, each uh, pitch gets 10 minutes at the end of a show to tell us about their product, their service, their business. Standard pitch deck. And this quarter we've had three of those pitches. Near the end of the quarter, that's today, our judges join us to talk about what they liked, what they didn't like, and to ultimately tip their hat towards a winner. Now, for the next time around that we do this, we're all done for quarter three, but for the next time that we do this, anybody who wants to get involved in this, send your pitch deck to pitchparty at medtechcrossroads.org. You don't have to be in the state of Michigan. We love Michigan-based startups, but you don't have to be in the state of Michigan. You have to be in the U.S. You don't have to be a med device. You could be a drug. You could be a health service of some sort. It doesn't really matter. As long as it is medical technology trying to better the human condition, we would love to hear from you. Presentations are limited to 10 minutes, PowerPoint format, uh, in the areas of problem statement, vision, value proposition, team, milestones, business model, your competitors, often forgotten, and the ask, 
or the functionally equivalent areas. Our judges, our esteemed judges, uh, Andy Rader, who is the managing partner of Evergreen M&A Partners, when he comes on in just a minute, I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit more about Evergreen. Dr. Nikki Kennedy, she's a vascular surgeon. She's the founder of ArborHive. Dr. Kennedy had let us know a while ago. She's not able to be with us today, but we do have in this envelope her comments and her choice. Uh, she has actually uh, partially moved careers and uh, she is in training today and she knew that was coming, so she let us know but has participated uh, there. Um, Jim Metzger, the president of Keystone Solutions Group. Keystone, a turnkey uh, design and manufacturing firm on the west side of Michigan. Jim had to step out at the last minute today. So sadly, Jim, uh, while we do have his vote, um, had a, um, a sort of a family emergency that he had to step out for. So we, we wish him the best. Uh, hope things are doing well there for Jim. And also with us today, Stacy Frankovich the program manager from MedHealth, MedHealth uh, working a cross-border uh, initiative between Southeast Michigan and Southwest Ontario. We'll let Stacy tell us a little bit more about the MedHealth initiative. Also, I just wanna mention really quickly, we didn't tell you what ArborHive is. ArborHive is for the doctors, for the innovators. Hey, a lot of us are involved in the delivery of medical technology, in the development of it, but it's kind of a scary world if you're a doctor or an innovator wanting to get into it and not knowing who should I trust, what should I do, how should I even approach this. And a lot of, a lot of innovators have gotten burned, frankly, over the years. And so what Dr. Kennedy is doing is, is letting them all come together, share best practices, talk about how you can approach innovation and technology development. So we think that's really cool. I want to tell you about Ar Arbor Hive as well uh, because she's doing a really cool thing with that. So with that, what I want to do is I'm going to stop the share here and I'm going to welcome, uh, first of all, uh, Stacy Frankovich to the show, the program manager for MedHealth. Thank you. Always good to see you, Stacy. How are you doing today? I am good. It's great to be here. Great to see you as well. Great to have you. The pressure is ramped up today. We do have votes from all four judges, but the thing that we like to do is educate and comment and Man, we're putting a big burden on on uh, on you and Andy today. So, but before we get there, tell us more about Med Health and about any upcoming things that you guys have happening. Sure, thank you. So, as you mentioned, we are a cross border collaboration between Southeast Michigan and Southwest Ontario, and we really work to be an ecosystem facilitator. Our goal is to help med tech startups or med tech um, innovators really navigate the vast landscape of resources that exist. And we do that by connecting, convening, and educating. We pull people together for important conversations. We educate the ecosystem on what resources exist and um, what opportunities are available. And we absolutely convene people in um, the larger, um, broader sense by uh, hosting events and, and various webinars and, and different things of that nature. So speaking of convening, on October 21 and October 22, we will um, be convening our MedHealth Matchmaking Mixer. And um, this is actually a replacement of what is typically a live event, um, but due to COVID, we're going fully virtual again this year. And really that opens up some cool opportunities because we're able to um, have conversations and talk to people across the US. Um, outside of the US in many other different countries. Last year, our virtual event brought um, participants from nine different countries. So we're hoping to um, see that again this year. But this year we're doing um, a lot of the same. It's, it's a matchmaking mixer. So we're highly focused on creating valuable matches. So this platform that we use, Brella, allows us to um, have these 15 minute introductory conversations with potential stakeholders, potential um, collaborators. And we bring in university faculty, entrepreneurial support resources, uh, health systems, investors, um, private sector, uh, manufacturers, and industry leaders. So all of these people will be available for you to have really important conversations with and see if there's any synergies or opportunities to collaborate. And we'll also have a keynote, and we're going to have some breakout discussions on some really important topics that you might think are outside of healthcare. 
really aren't. A lot of different things, you know, funnel into um, a person's overall well-being and health. So we're really looking forward to it. It's a free event. It's virtual. Jean has the registration up, and we hope to see you all there. Great, thank you, Stacy. Yeah, great event, and I uh, hope people can can make it to that uh, because. I don't know, I think over the course of COVID, a lot of people coasted on the relationships that they had. And, you know, not all of us love networking. We don't all love getting out there and talking to people. But this is your reminder that it's it's a good thing. Get out there, do it, talk to people. Uh, still has to happen. We have to make those new connections. And, and MedHealth is hosting that. Yeah, and I think sometimes, Dean, because you're right, you know, that networking can be really hard for people. And um, I think the virtual format gives people a little bit more security in being able to do that. You know, I know you're still face-to-face, -face, but you're still kind of in your own comfortable location. Um, so I, you know, regardless of what happens going forward, we certainly hope we're over the hump a bit and some of the numbers you showed were great um, indicators that we're heading in the right direction. But I think MedHealth, when we do go live, will always keep um, some type of virtual um, piece of our live events to ensure that we can include everybody that needs to be included and can have important conversations. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for all you're doing. We appreciate it. And obviously gives you a cool seat to see much of the community, which is why you're here judging with us today. We'll bring you back here in just a second. Next up, I want to welcome Andy Rader, who's managing partner of Evergreen M&A Partners a company that I've always been very impressed with because you guys like us, I think, Andy, you you deal with reality um, and you have shown value in so many different places. Tell us how we should think about Evergreen M&A Partners and who should get connected. Yeah, thanks, Gene. And in many ways, we're kind of two peas in a pod, aren't we? Uh, kind of two, two sides of the same coin. So uh, I, I'm founding partner at EMA Partners. We've been around about 20 years. We're technically based in Denver, uh, Colorado, but we have an office in Ann Arbor uh, where I'm sitting now. You can see my putty walls behind me. Um, and for 20 years, we've helped small life science companies, including med tech companies, when they reach an inflection point. And what we do is uh, take them through a process where we help them explore their strategic options. And those range, they're always transaction oriented, but they range from fundraising to out licensing of core or non-core IP, um, and all the way up through uh, collaborations, development, developmental collaborations or commercial uh, collaborations, and then all the way up through outright company sales. We do a fair number of those. So what we really do generally is bridge the gap between small entrepreneurial, um, you know, development oriented companies, even if they're pre-revenue in some uh, sectors, uh, and the very, very large uh, investment pools and uh, strategic entities um in their space so that's what we do well we've always been impressed with how you guys can find value uh with companies and, and part of finding value is 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 being able to clearly say where there's not any too right and, and just cut through um for for these industries so such a cool such a cool service definitely yeah, if you're thanks. in a startup or an existing company you're looking for um options boy these guys are awesome to talk to well, I thank you both for being here. Um, all of the education burden is, is is falling on you guys today, so I do apologize for that. Yeah, but Gene, um, I mean, we're the two best panelists anyway, right? Hey, so, you know, and there's no one to say too. otherwise. There's no one to defend themselves here today. So, yeah, uh, so I hope Nikki's is... watching. You know, okay. <laughs> I'm sure she will be. Oh, she's probably watching going, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> what are they going to do? Where are they going <laughs> to get in trouble? Do? <laughs> do it on me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, before I ask you the first and most important question, um, which, uh, which I think you're going to enjoy, uh, we actually did have a question here, and this was for Stacy. Um, the question came in, can this event, I think referring to the MedHealth matchmaking mixer, can it be used to find co-founders? Well, that's an interesting question. I've never heard that question. That's a great question. Well, I, I, and I, I'm going to give this really politically correct answer here. We don't, we don't make any guarantees, to, to be honest, on what the connections will be clearly. But um, what I will say is, again, these are introductory meetings. So we really, we do educate our, our, our innovators that participate that it's, they really shouldn't show up into this meeting with a pitch deck. It's not really a pitch. It's an opportunity to meet 
multiple different individuals from various sectors that could potentially um, help help you commercialize your business or get your business to the next level. Um, could you find a co-founder? Sure. Um, could you find in a cooperative agreement with another um, health system or an organization? Potentially. Um, could you find somebody that can help you get some specific work done? Absolutely. Um, so that, that's kind of my politically correct answer. Again, many sectors represented and um, a lot of conversations. And I think that you can certainly um, get leads into the, the specifics that you're looking for. Great answer. Great answer. That's awesome. Well, and we hope people can get involved and, and look for those connections. Well, let's turn our attention to the pitch party. And, uh, and, and, and just as we start to do that, there's a question I have to ask because it's become the theme question for this fall. And you guys may or may not have encountered it yet, but we always uh, have relied on Ken Spencer to bring us interesting things. And, uh, and Ken brought us some interesting information about the nature of the Apple industry. And so the question is, coming into fall in Michigan, what is your favorite type of apple? You weren't that's, expecting that one, were you? That's easy, Honeycrisp. I mean, Ooh, okay, Honeycrisp. Ever, ever since Honeycrisp came along, I mean, Red Delicious has just been dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gene and I answered this question a few weeks ago, and I oh, said, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I'm forgetting though, Stacy. Yeah. Remind us. I, I'm pretty sure I said the same thing. Honeycrisp too, yeah. yeah. I, and I think I, I, I've always been this Fuji person who like is is slowly falling out of fashion because Fuji is yeah. just you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, you could say that and still be cool. And now you're not allowed to. So. It's all Honeycrisp now. Fuji it's is all so uncool now. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Well, and okay. no reason. I, I, don't, don't send me a green apple. I really, I don't want a green apple. Yeah, I, and except for caramel apples. They're great as caramel apples. That's true. That's true. I, you know, you don't see the green because you're, you know, so. You know, Once it's a caramel apple, though, it almost doesn't matter what's underneath, right? Like, right. Because that's the caramel true. just sort of that's takes right. it over. More that's I thought, great. You know, Gene, I thought you were going to ask, just flipping the, the scripture a little bit, I thought you were going to ask about pumpkin spice because everybody's about pumpkin spice and I don't like it. I'm like yeah. that weird anomaly. I do not want a pumpkin spice latte. I, I don't want any of it. So Interesting. Excited, Interesting. By pumpkin. Well, it, and that's, 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 that's fascinating. I mean, I, I am also, you put too many things in something and I'm kind of, I'm kind of out. Uh, the man himself is actually here with us, uh, Ken Spencer, and he's got his hand raised. So we just have to let this go for just a minute. Ken, you're live. <laughs> so Dean, I, I know I sent you the uh, write up on Red Delicious, right? And, and how it came about, right? I mean, it's a totally, yes. totally marketing thing, right? It, it tastes awful. But by calling it Red Delicious, people were like, okay, I'm going to buy this, you know, kind of thing. I mean, it was a total marketing play. And I understand that they, uh, from, from the article you sent, that they actually made it more red. And by doing so, they made it taste worse and yeah, exactly, it sold better. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. Yeah. This is actually why we're here. We're here to adjudicate the fall traditions of the state of Michigan. I just want you to know this is exactly why we're here. We're getting the comments coming in. Uh, and and Stacy just said uh, pumpkin spice or not. Um, Mitch said feed corn or sweet corn. Uh, Jeff is complaining that he needs something tart. Uh, so yeah, this has just completely exploded into a uh, into a what what do you need uh, in your fall? Um, if if we were a little bit more traveling based, I think we'd now be doing a, a pure Michigan uh, travel around the state, and maybe that's what we well, should do I'm, next time. We should have the next judging from an apple orchard. And the age old question: candy corn is it still relevant? Oh. Oh, yes, I like candy corn. I am one of the weird ones that really likes candy corn and, and it is relevant. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. So okay. Stacy, do, do you still like Pez? Do you remember Pez? I do like Pez. <laughs> yes. I will admit yeah. to having eaten candy corn. I will admit to it. I, I, I feel like I have to scorn it. It's like a social necessity, but. We all walk by the bowl. The little pumpkin candy corn. I mean, it was still candy corn, but it was in that pumpkin shape. I mean, I can't walk past one of those because that was what was in my grandmother's candy dish all fall. 
growing up. He's the little the pumpkin candy corn. So yeah. Oh no, he's just left. I think he's going to get. Uh, this oh, is gonna. He's this going is. To get some. This is why on network TV they. Oh my goodness! This is why network TV oh. has a five second broadcast can delay I, just for things I, like this. Can I just have that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! It has taken it has taken a new twist. There's the candy corn. Off the corn. rails, off the rails, Gene. There's uh, and and our friend Jeff Reinvelt is is just uh, is just completely sending it under the table. It's just wax, he says. So. <laughs> flavored wax? I mean, it's flavored wax. It's it is flavored wax with a little bit of sugar added, which probably is corn syrup. Wouldn't it be funny if they didn't use corn syrup and candy corn, and it was something else like beet? I don't know. Okay, we're way off target here, we're but it's fun. Track. I will <laughs> I will do a research project on candy corn, and and um, I will bring that back to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, we appreciate it. I, I can see this is going to have to become a feature. We're going to have to have the food discussions as a part food of MedTech thing. Crossroads. Yeah. Which food is most likely to send you to the ERs that we shouldn't be going to right now? Yeah, okay. Well, with that, and actually, uh, we got Ken Spencer still on the line. Ken, uh, Ken, you're always uh, you're always good for stuff. We would love to have you stay on uh, live with us. And as we have these, uh, these uh, comments being made, um, you and I chatted briefly just before the show. Uh, you know, if you have any uh, fun thoughts, it's already a party. We'd love to have you uh, stick around and, and join us. So if that's sure, a possibility you. for you. Let's bring the share back up here. We have three uh, companies this, uh, this quarter. The company Wearology, like many, they are focused on different products, but with a first product out there, the portable PT parallel bars. Um, that they're doing and Gina Adams, uh, her presentation focused around the company and also around their portable parallel bars. We'll run through all three here and then we'll go back one by one and let our judges, um, as well as Ken, uh, comment on those. The solution here from Kevin White um, of Maverick Biomedical, a very punchy presentation uh, and a Mechanical solution for allowing users to lift their limbs, uh, quadriplegics and such. Um, interesting there. And then lastly, Brian Stewart from HDO Health. Again, they seem to be a multi-product company, but first focused on this journicket, a uh, health junctional tourniquet, uh, obviously for trauma and battlefield use. So those are our three for the, for the quarter. Let's go back to uh, Gina Adams and Wearology. And I think what we're gonna do, uh, Steve and I were just talking, given the way that this is um, being judged today, we do again have votes from all judges. Um, I do have those from Jim and also uh, we have here sealed up. I have no idea what's in this one uh, from Nikki uh, Kennedy with her comments and her hat tip at the end. But I think what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna focus on the education first. And then what I'm gonna have, we were talking about this earlier, but given that it's a sort of a strange week, I'm gonna have uh, Stacy and Andy uh, under chat, send me your votes when this is all said and done. After that, and this was Steve's suggestion, we're gonna have you guys, if you want, explain why you made the vote that you made. But we'll do a little reveal uh, since we have two votes here that are that are sort of under a lock and key. So with that, uh, Stacy, Andy, who wants to kick this off first in terms of the portable PT parallel bars, wearology, and our friend Gina Adams? Andy, why don't you jump in? Yeah, my boys have to Yeah. Yeah, so I like this a lot. Um, I thought the presentation itself was well put together. Obviously, Gina ran out of time at the end and left some questions hinted at uh, or answers to questions sort of hinted at that she didn't get to. And I'll, I, you know, we can talk about what else I at least would have liked to have seen in the presentation. I think some of it would have been in there, um, but wasn't. But I, I thought she did a good job sort of specking out um, the population and the user, user set. I think it's an intuitively appealing uh, product. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. But for me, there are some questions that were unanswered. I like the idea of having a portable unit that could go to bedside. And I like the idea of that um, helping, helping in terms of efficiency, increasing PT compliance and helping with sort of efficiency, PT uh, uh, physical therapist efficiency, 
um, getting around without having to transport patients, or at least staff efficiency. Some, and it's it's sort of annoying, but some modeling around that would be nice. Some idea about how long it takes generally to transport patients. And this isn't a do or die kind of thing, but some sense for how much time is spent, how much risk is taken by transporting patients around. Um, that That's a sort of a health economics automatic saving spot from my point of view. Um, uh, I like the fact that it's uh, in a study and also that she's already sold the 100 units. And I feel like she kind of buried that lead. I would have brought some of that stuff farther forward, uh, but they're both uh, strong positive. Um, FDA class one, strong positive for me. Um, and then the last piece, and I know I'm, I'm jumping through it on kind of giving an overview of my, my thoughts. Um, the last piece was really um, on sort of specs. I would have liked to have known more about how much it weighed you know, how it's actually used, even a short uh, uh, demo of it being wheeled in somewhere or picked off a car, set up, some sense of how it actually uh, operated. And then the last piece, I guess, is, uh, is it suitable for home use, right? Mm. So sense of the cost. Um, she was going to get to reimbursement and didn't quite get the chance, but I assume it can't be reimbursed as equipment, although uh, I would think for home use, there might be a reimbursement code for um, a rental, a DME, uh, you know, rental rate per month uh, for home use. So those were kind of all my thoughts. So Stacy, I just tossed all that out there and, you know, sort of uh, across the board for me, but that's, that's, those were my takeaways. Um, but on the whole, I thought it was a, a strong presentation and I, I, I like the product. I like the idea. Mm. That's, I, I like your, um, the point that you made at the outset there about the, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I just had a mental blank. Your very first point, Andy, uh, struck me also. Um, I don't know if you can re go back in your notes there. Um, yeah. About the uh, context, about the population and user set. And, and also, she expanded it to, to include age in place, um, which is that transition sort of to home home health and home support. And then you get to you get to go from there to, you know, you don't have a professional caregiver in the house. So how much does it help an, uh, the person who's giving care, the non-professional caregiver, how much would it help them if they could actually uh, not do PT, it's not a PT regimen, but to have a way to get um, their spouse or their child or their parent out of bed and, and do the same stuff they do with PT right next to the bedside, not have transport, I'm not have to worry about that. So anyway. I'm, I'm rambling a bit. But. No, and that's that exactly what it was, was this whole, and it goes back to the general idea for startups of you have to know what the value is, and the value is often in terms of something else that's not happening or could be happening or is being lost, and I think that's kind of what you're pointing at is yeah. do you understand what the that part of the market and what you're replacing there? Great comments, great comments. Stacy, your thoughts? Um, yeah, those were great. And Andy, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what on something you said, which was kind of the modeling around, um, you know, how this can be used and um, how many people are in PT or how many people will be needing, you know, this type of assistance. Because what I'm I'm curious to know is, you touched on, you know, a can it is it something that could be rented or bought? if a family is providing care. And if that is the case, has there been any thought process into, and I, I guess I'm going out in left field here a little bit, but is there any thought process into assisting a family member in providing specific care through a virtual model? So that um, if you are able to rent this piece of equipment and help your family member, you know, is there the opportunity to have somebody that's guiding you in a virtual manner so that you are doing things correctly? Um, I was wondering about um, how, and she didn't get to this, so a few of the questions that came to me, well, I'll just go down my list. So um, I, I want her to tighten up her intro. I will, I will say that her intro, um, I think, is what ate a lot into her, um, into her pitch and why she went over. And her personal story is really, really important. So um, I would just say that if she can, if we can get her personal story a little tightened up, that will save her some time um, towards the end. And I've seen this product before. I actually saw the demo of this that she did through Centropolis. So I think it's pretty cool. I really do like this product. And I think with people trying to age in place, there's a, a lot of opportunity there. Um, 
things that she didn't get to at the end that you know are still kind of those looming questions is kind of what is the ask? Um, how much is she looking to raise? I know she's got revenue, but how much is she looking to raise? Um, and I, I think it was kind of glossed over the sales and distribution and manufacturing channels. I don't know that she dove deep enough into kind of what that strategy looked like. So I would have liked to have known a little bit more um, on if she is targeting a specific organization that she would like to help her with the, the sales and distribution or if she is, is really looking for that and if that's one of her asks that she needs that, that assistance. Um, so I'll stop there. That, that was some of what I thought about it. Those are, those are great comments. Yeah. And of course, our goal here, education and, and saying, you know, what from a holistic perspective didn't we see and what did we like? And uh, I think those are, the, those are the nature and the flavor of the comments. Well, since we're down to educators today, um, Ken and I touched base just before this, and Ken agreed to share a few comments too. Of course, Ken is with us. Last year, I think you all know, we made him the, uh, the honorary host of MedTech Crossroads because Ken has been such a participant. Um, Ken, I don't know if you're only on video or on, only on audio today or if you're also on video. I, I'm happy to start your video if that's so. Uh... Well, believe me, I'm, I'm good with audio. <laughs> audio only. Okay. Well, the inimitable, inimitable Ken Spencer from U of M's MSERC, um, always with us, a great participant. Ken, uh, do you have any you have any pros and cons? Obviously, it's not a vote today, but uh, any pros and cons that you'd like to share from your from your experiences uh, when well, you look at I Worldology? I certainly hear Andy and Stacy's comments. I mean, to me, sometimes these things simple is good. Mm. And, um, you know, I really like the fact that they had a class one approval, you know, out there. And they, to Stacy's comment, they, they didn't get to talk much, much about the sales and distribution, but I think it potentially is huge. Um, but the other initial, like, innovator, early adopter use in here is in terms inside the hospital um, you know, when you, for instance, in the COVID stuff, any, anybody has been, you know, on an ICU bed for a couple of weeks. I mean, it is, it is incredible as to how difficult it is to get people to, to get up and walk. And in, in a COVID sense, you can't transport them through the hallways, you know, out there. So, you know, the, the ability to have something like this bedside, I think is, is really, really important. And I, I would think, and, and all the hospitals, by the way, I mean, you all have the PT aspect coming in there, right? So, so this would be really, really valuable. So I, I, I really liked it. I mean, to, to the points of, she didn't get a chance to talk about some of the specifics and the sales and marketing out there, um, but clearly, um, you know, I, I, I love the simplicity and certainly the value add is there. Great comments. And just to something you all alluded to, sort of the lost time at the end of not being able to reference. I think Gina did share with us that she had just, before she did the pitch, she had just lost somebody uh, near and dear to her. Um, so obviously it was a little bit of a hard, uh, a hard day. So insofar as we uh, don't want that to reflect, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're not dinging her, but I hope everyone will take that into account with your, with your votes as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for those comments. Let's go on to our second uh, company, this Maverick Biomedical. Um, and yeah, where, where do you guys go with this? Stacy? do you want to want to start us out here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I actually wrote this. I'm like, badass design. Nice touch. Um, <laughs> so I kind of like that they came in with that fervor and that excitement. So I did like that. Um, I... I would like to see um, perhaps a, a short video or a short snippet to really understand how it works because I was not, this picture did not give me a really clear understanding of how it works. Um, so I would have liked to have had a little bit more information on that. It was really unclear. Um, there was a slide where he talked about, um, I think kind of the marketing piece of it and they had, he had a, some dollar signs and some people and some uh, building and, and talked about um, implementing this into curriculum. And I think that was a little confusing. I, I think he lost me a little bit there um, because I wasn't sure how implementing it into curriculum was part of the marketing strategy and, and, and how that 
work together. Um, so I'd like to see him drill into that a little bit. I like the personal story. I like um, that he is he has a reason for this and it's important. And I, I think he got that across quite well. I thought the pitch was very well done in the fact that he was on, you know, he, he stayed on message and, and told the story in a very succinct manner, even though I think there was some missing information. Um, but he he was he was spot on. Um, so class one medical device. Um, I wasn't sure if, if they've already achieved that or if that's coming. Um, and I'm not quite sure, um, again, you know, what is their sales distribution manufacturing kind of plan? Um, and you know, what does that look like? And are they talking to um, an organization? Are they working with somebody to identify that? Um, so I was a little, I would have liked to have heard a little bit more about that. I think that gets lost often. People talk about the product and the sales and the potential market. And sometimes that kind of that sales marketing, manufacturing distribution goes a little bit by the wayside. Um, so that's, those are my comments. I guess. That's, that's, that's really I interesting, guess. Stacey. Is this is this almost a case? I mean, I remember back in the day, we would often really have to look at companies hard and, and ding them because they were so technology focused and so enamored with their technological solution that was like, hold on, there's a market, there's a user out there. Have you thought about that? I mean, are we now starting to see companies here where we're actually telling them almost almost the opposite? Like, hey, it's great that you think you've found a niche tell us more about how you're going to, what the technological solution is and how you're going to execute on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, everybody has this preconceived idea of kind of sales and marketing and, and it's, it's more of an afterthought. And I, I think, I think it should be thought of more upfront when you're literally validating this technology, you have to be thinking about, okay, if people want it, then what are the channels that we can get this to them and how I those channels. And when it comes to hardware, you know, you really do have to start to identify distribution. You have to understand what your manufacturing specs are going to look like. Um, and maybe, you know, not get in the weeds in a pitch about it, but to at least acknowledge that you understand what that roadmap looks like. Does that make sense? Good. Yeah, that's good. Andy, your thoughts? Yeah, Gene, I agree with you completely. You know, you, a lot of people start with meeting an unmet need, which is really important. Obviously, that's sort of the, the driver behind what will eventually hopefully become market adoption. But boiling it down into, you know, how you approach that market, who's specifically going to use it and how you're going to reach them matters a lot. And then also, you got to take it back to, you know, you're saying this, I think, you have to take it back to the device or the platform or whatever and explain how it specifically does it. And, and I thought that uh, Kevin did a, a, a good job with that verbally, but I agree with Stacy. I think um, a demonstration video or a more comprehensive diagram set or picture set would have been really helpful. because so I just didn't get a sense for how the device actually worked. Um, I like the graph that showed that it did work. And I like the graph that, that sort of by definition showed why it was superior to the platforms that are out there. Um, but it didn't really answer the question for me of, of you know, how does it literally work? And it sounds like it can be attached to a wheelchair, but I didn't really get that. Um, at least I think it can. Um, but, uh, and then I also agree with Stacy on sort of the, the need to discuss, and this ties into the whole holistic story you're talking about, I think. You need to talk about how it's gonna be made some sense for at volume costs, maybe not in the initial pitch, but the financial dynamics uh, end up mattering a lot to almost anyone you talk to. Because if you're gonna go talk to one of the big uh, companies in this space, they're gonna look at, you know, at full volume, what are production margins? And then they're gonna look at uh, even more than that, how well does it fit into our Salesforce approach, right? How, how do we take that last step toward, um, to, toward customers? Who's the actual customer? How do we take that last step toward them? And, and, do I have a system that, that's already sort of uh, focused on that? So all that, but uh, I actually really like the curriculum teaching uh, concept. Uh, we had a client years ago, it was a handheld um, x-ray device for dentists. And they had ended up, by the time uh, they hired us, and we sold them to a very large dental equipment company. Um, 
it succeed. They had gotten as far as they had, and they were doing 20 or $30 million in revenue by the time we sold them. They'd gotten that far because years before they had begun donating handheld units to, uh, to the med schools, the dental, dental schools. And, and a whole crop of young dentists grew up uh, with those things in their hands um, on training. So I like the idea of it, but realize it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a longer lead time sort of uh, marketing pathway. Um, but it can be really effective uh, getting it in users' hands. I agree with that. I when I was uh, in my first um, job out of school, when I was tasked with going and finding a piece of software, I went to the manufacturer of the software that I had trained on in school. Now we actually didn't stay with them long term. It wasn't the best long term solution for the company. But who got that first year's worth of business from us? Well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, you still got to deliver the product, right? But yeah, that's great. Well, and one of the toughest dynamics that most equipment device, actually most any consumable device platform or diagnostic for that matter runs up against is the fact that that uh, behaviors are entrenched and the older the user base is, the decision-making user base, the more entrenched those practices are. And so, you know, a lot of folks assume that if they have a great idea and a decent marketing pathway, that, that they will just get adoption. And it's, it doesn't work that way. And, and the big companies know that. I mean, whatever adoption curve you put in front of them, they'll double it or triple it or quadruple it, especially if it involves physicians. Sorry, Nikki, if you're listening. <laughs> oh, she'll get that. Believe me. That's great. <laughs> Ken, what are your thoughts on this one? We'd love you some color from you. So, yeah. So first of all, I would have loved to have seen a video on, on yeah. how, how this works. I mean, I really, the, the pitch was great. But that, that really, and enthusiastic and all those kinds of things, but we really needed to see that video on, you know, on how this works. Um, you know, and, and the class one stuff, it's not clear whether it is or not, you know, or they, they got that approval or not to me when I, when I looked through the, through the pitch. So, so that's important in terms of, I think, in, you know, adoption and things like that. Um, and the other thing that, bothered me a little bit was the name <laughs> maverick bio i mean i i think they need to look at work on that because you know mm -hmm. this is a very targeted device right i mean they this that doesn't ring true doesn't tell you anything about you know what it is so i i so that's just from a you know what is maverick bio and you know my 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 impressions on this. I mean, overall, the pitch was was really good. But if I would give one feedback, it's like, man, change your name. That's an interesting one. Yeah, because you, you're what you're sort of saying is uh, you, we're we're trying to be punchy, but at some point, we need to communicate what we're there for. Can and I throw in one, yeah? Can I throw in one more thing? I, I absolutely like to comment on the pitch itself. I thought Kevin did do a really nice job with the pitch itself. It was uh, very efficient, very polished, flowed really well, um, concise and clear. So I just wanted to throw that in and, and give the, the kudos there. Um, it could have been a little deeper as we talked about. You know, didn't use all of his time, um, could have swept deeper on things like FDA approvals and what his production pathway, he intends his production pathway to be, that kind of thing. But, uh, but uh, I thought the pitch itself, the, the presentation itself was uh, nice and tight. Good, yeah, good comment. Yeah, and, and all these uh, constructive mm -hmm. criticism, obviously, there so that uh, folks can take it back and, and for whatever the next pitch is in your in your pitch season, you can take that to heart. Good. Well, let's move on to the third one, and that is HDO Health, uh, their junctional tourniquet, Brian Stewart, the presenter. Um, should we go back to you, Andy, for this one? Sure. Yeah. I like this a lot um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the whole story held together really well. Again, I think it's an intuitively appealing uh, storyline. Um, I think it, even though it's not a need that most of us would have thought about before, uh, it makes intuitive sense. Um, they explained, he explained it really well, really clearly, really quickly. And then everything else sort of backed it up, right? Um, I liked his, uh, the entire management team and advisory team. It suggested that they had a whole focus, not only on, on figuring out a device that would work and knowing that there was a need to be met, but also the next step, which is the downstream step. 
because anything that's sort of DOD, anything that's military, it's an absolutely fantastic pathway to get on, but lots of people think they can get on it and it's harder than you think to get started. But that crew looks like they're sort of oriented well to, to do that. So it's, it looks like a, a, a well-focused device that was thought through for all the right reasons. What I don't know is how it works and sort of whether it works. So I would have liked a little more data on that. And I also would have liked a diagrammatic explanation or even a video of it being used so I could see it in the hands of somebody, get a sense for um, how it solves the problem, even though it's not a problem that I had ever specifically contemplated before. I understand, especially battlefield and, and uh, uh, trauma, uh, you know, car accident and trauma events. I understand the, the hemorrhage issue, but I hadn't thought about it being at a torso uh, uh, limb um, juncture per se, but uh, you know, a demo would have helped me a lot. And then I have a, a, some other, a bunch of other specific uh, positives and negatives. Uh, the biggest negative, of course, is that it comes out of Ohio and specifically Ohio State. So that's going to be a challenge for me personally. Um, but but that aside, I, I do have some other specific ups and downs, but I'll stop talking now. We'll, we'll trust you to keep it strictly professional when it comes to the <laughs> judging. <laughs> No, I love it. Great comments. Great comments. Stacy. yeah, your thoughts. Oh, I was waiting for that, Andy. <laughs> um, I saw a message. Oh, you got you to go bucks in the chat. We don't usually uh, <laughs> in, involve uh, involve people during the commenting for this, but uh, you, you, you got to go bucks. So it's, it's starting to escalate now. <laughs> um, and I'm not a U of M alum, so you know, I'm not even a Michigan-born resident. So I, I have nothing against Ohio. Um, however, and I, I was looking real quick while while you were talking, Andy, because or, um, because the product is really a military application. You know, that's the that's kind of what they're looking for is their first. And um, several years ago, I worked for the Macomb OU Business Incubator. We worked very closely with at KCOM General Dynamics Land Systems. You know, so we were pretty pretty well um, versed in the sector. And it's a very very long road. But there used to be a website, government.ops or something, which is all the government contracts. It's now, I was just looking for it. It's now sam.gov, sam.gov. And he should um, he should be looking for opportunities. If he didn't know it. That was just a thought. Um, so as far as the, the pitch goes, I thought the pitch was good. I thought um, I thought the product definitely is good. They identified clearly, um, you know, why this product is important. Um, I will say I felt that it was a very wordy presentation, and I actually caught myself multiple times rewinding to listen because I was reading, um, and that's never a good thing. So um, I think there were areas where they could trim down the content and talk more about the product and the, the plan. Um, I will be very specific. I thought slide five was definitely too much. Um, and I thought that they focused on that that slide contains so many market, different market potentials. And he touched on that again at the very end of the presentation. And I thought that was enough at the end. I think that that slide five was um, a little overwhelming with all the different possibilities. We could use it here, we could use it here, we could use it here. And I think he could drill in a little bit more if, if it is a fact that they're going to position themselves in the defense sector in a little bit more to that and, and express what that pathway looks like more specifically. And then at the end, certainly identify we, you know, we know we have other potential markets. Um, but that was that's just one area I think I'm a little you know a little bit more critical on. Um, and then get a little bit more specific on the needs, um, what their needs are. I know um, Again, I don't recall hearing too much about their manufacturing and their distribution and kind of that whole, I know I'm you know, kind of harping on that today, but I'm not hearing a lot about what that looks like. Um, so those were my notes, sorry. I no, that's great. Also, Stacy, we're getting some audio uh, troubles from your, from your end. It keeps coming in and out uh, dramatically. I don't know if... Uh... There's an auto leveler happening there, or if you're not close to your microphone, but um, maybe take a look at that. I think um, we got most of that. You know what? I just changed. My that's mic. better. Oh, that sounds okay. good. Okay. Yep, that's great. Perfect. 
Hey, can I throw one more thing in here? I love the name Jernigan. Yeah. I thought that was a, you know, that kind of thing shouldn't matter, but it does. So, like that. Succinct, right? Mm hmm. He did Good. well at, at identifying the needs, really. I mean, truly, I think it's a product that um, has great application. Um, I think he did very, very well at that. Yep. Good. Great. Our friend Ken Spencer, any any last comments here on our third uh, on our third uh, company? Yeah, so so actually, we're very familiar with this issue because, as you, you might know, Kevin Ward is a lieutenant colonel uh, in the Army Reserves and just came back from Afghanistan, right? And internally, we have had a, a product uh, we call Groa, and which is more about about abdominal bleeding and things out there so we're we're very familiar with the with the issue out here and also very familiar with the driving force um, particularly from the military which is clearly one of the first targets right um, I don't know if you're aware of, uh, of what they look at now as prolonged field care so in the past um, we were looking at it extracting soldiers you know within 24 hours right but now we're looking at 72 hours because we may or may not have control of the skies and things out there so these kinds of things are really really important so there's no doubt in my mind that the uh, the military is going to be uh, really really uh, important to this because we know how they're involved with us with grow up the one thing that i didn't see them talking about was whether they had gone to san antonio for the army where they do all this stuff or right pat where the air force does all this stuff right i mean I, I don't know that they've identified those particular elements that we've already you know been been working with out there i would have think that would be very important to for them to uh, to make contact there so um, you know that's that's sort of my my input on it and and then further than that of course we the translation to the civilian side uh you know traumatic car crashes and things like that i mean you, you have all this stuff that's out there um but the training to do for the emts to do this versus training the military medics is like a, a whole different bridge to cross mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. move forward right good comment yeah very very domain specific uh, information there that's really uh really Gene, can i ask again. can i ask Ken a question though oh sure so, so Ken, as I was listening to this, and, and of course we're thinking about, you know, we've, we've kind of ended, you know, ended, if you will, the war in Iraq and, um, or Afghanistan and, and these, these things that are going on. And I, I was thinking so much more of, of a, a use, like you just mentioned, traumatic car accidents. Um, you know, there was, unfortunately, there was a mass shooting yesterday that seems to be happening more and more often. And I really thought, it would have been interesting for him to dive in a little bit deeper about the market and, and where maybe his beachhead makes more sense because I was leaning towards American use in, in everyday um, EMT. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think the military is going to be interested in it because there's always going to be something, you know, going on right out there. Right. And the, between IEDs and other things, I mean, this this is this is happening, so, and and they have experience in the issues that happen with with this kind of bleeding, you know, out, out through there, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but the same thing can be applied, I think, to the to the civilian market. But the issue is going to he's going to have to cross is in the training and how easy is is this to go do right? The the military medics are going to be totally trained in this. Right. So uh, it's it's how how do you expand that into the other EMT spaces and stuff? Right. Got it. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great comments. Well, we are at the top of the hour, so we will try to bring it to a wrap <clears throat> pretty quick here. We know people are hanging on for that big, big decision. And since we uh, have votes from our two absent judges, uh, we're going to we're going to first of all give our two present judges, thank you guys for all your carrying the load today, uh, the opportunity to send me via chat, so through the hosts and panelists chat, which is your hat tip, Stacy and Andy? Oh. 
Oh, I spelled it wrong. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. We'll be okay there. <laughs> <laughs> I hit enter too fast. <laughs> I don't think they're part of the competition, Stacy. No, I don't think so. That might be a new a new name for them. <laughs> we have uh, we have uh, uh, Jim Metzger's vote as well, um, and I'm opening up. This was meant to be a, a tiebreaker, but since we're doing it this way, we're going to get uh, we're going to get we'll Nikki's. Don't make the mistakes they did on the Academy Awards there. Yeah, uh, yeah this is this is. Uh, <laughs> do you mean the wardrobe malfunction, or do you mean the uh, getting the getting no, the? No, no, no. Where they they presented the wrong envelope. Oh right, yeah, for the for the wrong thing. Well, so okay. you, need, you need a co you need a co-host up there. You have to have two of you at the podium. Yeah, well, we've been talking about getting back to uh, you know do, doing this kind of thing in person and, and such things, but we need the stage set for that, which we've been uh, which we've been talking about. Well, I think we have enough information to tell you who the winner is today of our four votes. We have one for Wearology. Congratulations. We have three for HDO Health and zero today for Maverick. So our winner today is HDO Health. Um, I am going to read just a bit of Dr. Kennedy's comments because uh, she did take the time to do some of the education here with us. Um, and her comments here on Wearology, I love Gina's passion and determination. She tells a great story and her company is founded on a true desire to help a vulnerable population. I struggled a bit with her performance here, time issues notwithstanding. I felt like she was selling her company more than a single project. Focusing on her current project and funding Ask more clearly would have helped me to follow her pitch a little better. Her story is great, but I kept losing track of the what because of the why. From Dr. Nikki Kennedy. Maverick Biomedical, I like the enthusiasm these guys brought to the table. Uh, they had a good balance of their what and their why. I did have trouble following how their device worked, something we heard echoed today. It sounded like their price point of $1,500 isn't that far off from non-powered similar devices, $2,500 I believe, but the true benefit of their minimum viable product wasn't clear to me from their pitch. I would have preferred if they spent a little more time on adding some content instead of buzzwords. HDO Health, I really liked this pitch. It addressed a simple, clear need. It had a realistic assessment of their market space, their regulatory pathway, and their financial milestones. My only issue was that it didn't include any detail of how their device works compared to existing technology and any data they may have had on their device's outcomes, e.g., does it actually work, something we heard earlier. Can they support their claims? And the tip of the Kennedy hat then went to uh, HDO Health. So I wanted to include so, that there. She's always so eloquent. Isn't she? And thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for taking the time. We're looking forward to having you back live uh, when things settle down. Um, settle down there. But our winner today, HDO Health, I also want to give um, our judges present, uh, if you want to comment um, on votes or why you made your hat tip the way you did, um, we, we tried it to, to flip it around today. If you if you want to make any further comments, any last comments, uh, we'd be happy to take those. Oh, you know what? I'm the only one that voted for I, for Wearology. They got the one vote, and I'll just I'll confess. Good. Tell us why. And I truly think it's because with COVID, we have um, missed the boat on the looming crisis of our right. aging population. And this is going to be such a relevant and much needed project to help our aging community age in place. And that was where my mind was with that. So great. No, thank you for sharing that. Andy, any last words? We can leave the last word in your uh, in your hands. Well, I always like that. Uh, yeah, I obviously I voted for HDO, as you guys know. Um, and, and I think Nikki said it really well. Um, it's just, uh, it, as I said in my comments, it wasn't even a specific need I thought of, but as soon as they presented it, it was very clear. And then they, they answered um, how they address it, and it seems like the right group to address it. I also agree with her her, uh, her criticisms about, um, you know, demo and, and be nice to be able to see how it works and data around how it works because that would also give you a sense for is there a class two device gives you a sense for what their fda path pathway actually would be but all that having been said it's just a, an intuitively appealing uh story and i thought they told it well great well thank you for all your comments and your time spent reviewing these uh, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it 
Uh, Brian Stewart will be following up with you uh, with a check for $2,500 uh, since you are the pitch party uh, hat tip winner. And uh, so go use that and, and do cool things with it. Uh, we're excited for you and for all of our uh, companies that pitched. Thank you for your time doing it. We really, really appreciate that. Ken Spencer, thank you today for popping in and contributing to the education and the feedback, especially the domain-specific stuff. That was that was awesome. What we'll do, as we always do at the end of every show, is just give a few seconds. If you raise your hand right now, it's because you want to tell us about some community event that's happening, something that's happening with your company, your effort, something like that. We're going to give just a few seconds to that before uh, we close it up here today. I want to thank our judges, especially Stacy Frankovich and Andy Rader, Jim Metzger and Dr. Nikki Kennedy, as always, for keeping this uh, part of the show going. We couldn't do it without you guys, and we always benefit from your insights. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jean. I hope Nikki's proud of us. I, you know, I think we did okay, Andy, and, and Ken was a great help. I think it's great. There may be some there may be some fisticuffs to follow up uh, later on on some of the comments made today, but you guys will take that uh, take that offline. So thank you for being with us on MedTech Crossroads today. Great show as always. Thank you for being here. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.